Welcome to Simplify's quarterly market and strategy update call. Before we get started, let's do a, a couple housekeeping items. Number one, this is meant to be informative, hopefully entertaining, educational, but um, not investment advice. So um, don't take any of this and go ahead and invest on it. Uh, there's a Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please utilize that if you have any questions for us as we're going through um, on any of the Simplify strategies or any of the kind of the macro uh, ideas that we're talking about, throw them in there. We'll try and incorporate them into the conversation or get to a you know, devoted Q&A section. If we don't get to it, uh, feel free to follow up with us at uh, info at simplify.us. Uh, you may notice a new face here. I'm a Delighted to introduce Paisley Nardini, who recently joined Simplify as a portfolio manager and asset allocation strategist. So she was last at Invesco, where she was a portfolio manager and strategist there. And then, like a lot of us at PIMCO, or excuse me, at Simplify, cut her teeth at PIMCO. And then Mike Green, who uh, who needs no introduction, so I won't give him one. Um, but this was a really big quarter for us, the third quarter of 2024. We celebrated our fourth anniversary, number one. Uh, we crossed six billion in assets under management, number two. And we, we we now have 31 strategies, which is crazy to think about that, um, considering we started you know with three products uh, four years ago and you know essentially zero dollars. Half of those strategies have over a hundred million in assets. Um, that growth has been, you know, it drawn a lot of attention. Uh, we were we were uh, recognized by Morningstar as the the second fastest grower within our category within the ETF space. So it's it's great to have some acknowledgement. That is all you know because of our clients. So so thank you everyone on this call who's a, who's a Simplify client and uh, you know hopefully um, it's been a good ride for you so far and and the best is yet to come. During the quarter, we also had three new products come to market. So number one, um, the Simplify National Muni Bond ETF, ticker NMB. So this is an active municipal bond strategy. It's a national muni strategy that has an income overlay. Uh, the Simplify Gamma Emerging Markets Bond ETF, ticker GAEM, which is an active emerging, emerging markets bond strategy. And then last but not least, uh, the Simplify Wolf ETF 150-50, which is a, a long short 150-50 um, that we're done in partnership with Wolf Research. The ticker is WUSA. It's a long short strategy, fits really nicely, nice addition to our alternatives lineup. Then the other thing I'll mention is uh, we just finished up, I guess it was two weeks ago at this point, our Entering the Fall Conference in New York at the New York Stock Exchange. New York Stock Exchange has been a great partner of ours. Uh, most of our strategies are listed there, um, but it was a day-long event. We had an incredible lineup of speakers. Hopefully, you know some of the people on this call were able to, to tune into that. If you weren't, take a look at our YouTube channel, uh, go to our website, take a look at some of those sessions. I don't know if uh, Mike or Paisley, you had a favorite one there, but just you know, awesome information sharing, and uh, we're excited to do it again next year. So um, let's get going. Paisley, you want to want to want to set us off? Yeah, absolutely. And I may be biased, but I would say um, my favorite session may have been the one that I moderated on Carrie. So make sure to check that out. <laughs> um, but no, super excited to have joined Simplify back in September. Um, I've been here, I guess, less than two months, but I already feel completely integrated. The team's amazing. And as Brian alluded to, the growth and the innovation and in, in launching new strategies is definitely one of the reasons uh, I decided to join. So really looking forward to meeting a lot of you in time. Um, and please reach out, please connect, um, super excited. So with that, let's just jump in. Uh, as Brian alluded to, a lot has transpired since we last came together. Uh, as we think about what came about in the third quarter, we had the value stocks surge at the beginning. Uh, we'll talk about kind of the delineation between the first half and the second half of the quarter. We had the volatility spike in early August. Uh, which now, if you're looking at the VIX, doesn't seem to even be a, an event, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, we, of course, had a lot of news coming out of China in the beginning of September and even mid-September around fiscal and monetary support. Um, so we'll see uh, what comes of that in the coming months, but there's been a lot of flows, of course, into China um, and also maybe some of the performance we can talk about. Uh, of course, very noteworthy, should have led with this, was the first Fed cut at the end of September, 50 basis points, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to markets. Um, and this was amidst, I would say, a backdrop of some coordinated kind of global easing across central banks in the developed market. Uh, Bank of Canada just cut rates by 50 basis points themselves as inflation is moderating in that region as well. So kind of similar theme, I would say, globally and some nuances, of course, uh, between the different countries and regions. 
Um, another thing we can talk about is despite the Fed cut um, and this belief that rates are going lower, lock in yields, we've seen just the opposite transpire. And so this is really what we believe to be a reflection of markets digesting, looking at the narrative from, from the Fed in lowering rates, but then also marrying that with the resilient backdrop of economic data. Um, inflation appears to be contained, but I think that remains in question. We can talk a bit about that as well. Um, and I would say Fed officials are even coming through and softening some of their language around future uh, market cuts. So to, uh, to be determined, uh, but a lot of uncertainty, I think, heading into your end. Um, if we take a step back, uh, thinking about the kind of typical or historical spread between the Fed funds rate and 10-year Treasury averages maybe about 150 basis points. Today, that's at negative 60 basis points. So a lot of room to maneuver, a lot of room for rates to move around over the next couple months here. Um, and by no means am I suggesting we're going to get to that 150 basis point historical spread in the next month or two. Uh, but you can just see a, a lot of uh, movement until we're kind of resting at those long term averages. Um, so with that, um, I would say there's also been a lot of volatility in rates. I think over the last quarter, one theme, if you look at where we were kind of towards the beginning of the quarter and where we ended, um, it may not appear as though that much has happened. Uh, but there was a lot of fluctuations as markets digested rate, rate cuts and that volatility spike I just mentioned. Uh, ten year alone fluctuated by 80 basis points over the quarter. And the two-year rate fluctuated, I think, by about 120 basis points throughout the quarter. Um, so despite this movement, I think the overall trend that we saw was really a steepening of the curve. Um, and Simplify, of course, has uh, strategies that look to capitalize on that and have had really strong performance as a result. Um, so maybe I'll talk about two different topics here up front before we dive in as well. And just thinking around bond market volatility. So uh, talking about people that need no introduction, like Mike, uh, Harley Bassman as well, one of our colleagues, recently wrote about the spike in bond market volatility. I would highly suggest everyone take a read. Um, and I will quote part of what he said in his, his paper, what bond market participants are believing that the range of outcomes uh, for this election is much wider than all other elections we've seen in history. And this is reflective of the level of the move index, which Harley created back in the 90s, which measures the volatility of, of uh, implied prices and bonds. So right now, the move index is around 130 as an absolute level. And this is really just in layman's terms telling us it's a two third chance that rates are going to close within plus or minus 130 basis points in the next year. So specific to the upcoming election, there's an expectation based on this index as well that rates might shift or move within 15 to 20 basis points in a single day. So I think a lot of the volatility and expectation of leading into the elections, there's a little bit more going on in the bond markets versus equity markets. Uh, if we're looking at implied volatility there is measured by the VIX index. Um, maybe a little bit elevated from historical levels, but really kind of around that long-term average, um, which is just telling us there's not sig signaling, um, excuse me, much concern in equity price volatility. My thoughts around that, maybe just thinking about the resiliency again of that economic data, um, continued trajectory of easing, of course, should support stock markets as well. And then as we look at where we are here today, the S&P is up over 25%. Um, so really strong backdrop. Um, and I think this week is at least on track, even though today I think markets were up broadly, um, on track to be one of the first weeks in the last month and a half that equity markets are going to be trending lower. Um, so we've seen a lot of steam in the last six weeks in equity markets and continued prices moving higher there. Um, so with that, um, we'll jump into some of the slides now, uh, what's ahead, and we'll talk about some of the immediate risks or maybe some longer term risks to markets. Uh, but next week is going to be big. Uh, we have big tech earnings, uh, we have payrolls, and then of course the week thereafter is election. So everything I'm sta stating today may be wildly different in a week or two weeks from now, um, but for now that's really the state of the market. Mike, anything immediately to add before we jump in? No, I think you hit on a lot of the key points. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about how the quarter was very divided in terms of its performance. 
Um, I would also emphasize the dynamic around the uh, interest rate volatility component. Harley does a really good job in his piece actually explaining some of the more technical ways you can think about isolating for a single day volatility. In equity markets, we have much less of that. The thing that I would really highlight about this election in the vol equity volatility space is that this is the first election that we're going to have single day options available for uh, the actual election itself. We do see some pricing of premium in equity volatility around the days immediately after the election. I would actually be very surprised if that number does not begin to rise as we get closer and closer to the election. There's the benefit of having that zero day option is, is that you can effectively choose to decide a day or two ahead of the election as to whether or not you're gonna you're going to actually hedge out those uh, those risks. I think we'll probably end up seeing more of that. And so some of the the uh, which you, you might describe as uh, lack of enthusiasm for volatility in the equity markets may very well just reflect the range of choices that are available there as compared to what's available broadly in the rate market. Great, appreciate that. Um, so maybe on that topic then that you mentioned about really the tale of two halves, um, and Mike had pointed this out to me when we were talking about performance last quarter, um, you'll see there's a gray dotted line that runs really at the end of July. So this is the full quarter. And what we saw happen in the month of July and then what we saw happen in the month of August and September was really two very different paths in the, in the equity market. And that's really what we're focused on here. Um, S&P 500 versus really Russell 2000 and looking at the value component for each of those. Um, you'll see here in the bottom left, the returns for Russell 2000 value index through the month of July over 12%. Right. So I think the, the market coming out of the quarter really fixated on that because you'll see where we ended. Russell 2000 value was the top performer, but much of that was just driven by what happened in the month of February or excuse me, July. Um, and then as we think about what happened in the back half of the quarter, um, really kind of that return to normalcy. Um, so we saw more of the, the larger cap companies, more of the growth oriented companies lead um, and so I just wanted to put that into perspective because there's this big focus on is there this resurgence in small cap stocks, is value coming back finally? Um, and really what we're seeing marked the third quarter is just a reflection of one month of performance. Um, the other topic on that I would mention is thinking about earnings expectations. So we've just started earnings season. Like I said, next week, we'll get a lot of information today. Tesla came out. Tesla's had um, one of the best days in, in years for the stock. Um, but if you look at a year-to-date period, Tesla is relatively flat. Um, but thinking about next week and some of those mega cap companies, um, that could really cause some dislocation as well. And we'll talk about um, that being a, a risk to mega caps and just markets um, more broadly. So you'll see here, small caps earnings obviously have lagged. Um, fundamentally, thinking about the drivers of that um, of those markets, there is expectation for that to pick up. Um, I, I would say personally, I think there's a lot that needs to come to fruition in order for that to happen. Um, but just wanted to put that into perspective, um, thinking about the quarter's performance. Paisley, can you drop, could jump back to the, the previous slide? Uh, yeah. as I wanted to just hit on a couple of components. Uh, part of the reason why we did split this is, is it is actually really important to understand that in July, we saw one of the best performances in a single month for the Russell 2000 value in its history. And if we change the quarter, right? So if we, if we think of the quarter as inclusive of that, then we had small cap and value outperformance. But if instead we had randomly decided to start it a month later, those literally turned into the absolute worst assets. This plunge, that decline that occurred was part of the reason why we got the Fed 50 basis point cut, I would argue. This was tied to the weaker non-farm payroll prints the better than expected inflation prints and really caused a significant component of the rate rally as well. I think that was a key contributor to the small cap value outperformance. The point that you're raising about um, the persistence on it and the earnings, I think if we go back to the next chart, you know, small caps are perennially, particularly in forward component, they're always, you know, it's gonna get better next time, right? Tomorrow it's, uh, uh, Everybody else on the uh, call is too young to remember the old ITT commercials, but you know, don't let tomorrow pass you by, right? Uh, small caps are, are the perennial, it'll always come in the future sort of component. There's very much a soft landing component embedded in these expectations. But the slide after this actually kind of hits on, on where my concern is, which is ultimately 
as long as money continues to flow into large cap stocks, the underwhelming performance of small caps is somewhat baked in. It's being driven by the component of money flowing into a broad index. That means that the largest sums of money are going to buy the large caps. And particularly when we have vehicles like total market indices, there really is no allocation process for adding back to small caps. So those who have listened to me for a long time have heard me talk about the spring of 2000 and the reallocation into small cap value that occurred that caused that wide move. The move in July was a very similar component. It was a function of discretionary managers trying to actually bet on a rebound in small encyclicals, et cetera, that ended up getting shortchanged. And today, I would actually argue you saw components of the same thing in almost an interesting reversal. When you see a company like Tesla rise, I think it was about $150 billion in market capitalization today. That's telling you in a very simple way that people had to move, had to get out, and that there just wasn't much volume to ultimately accommodate that. I would argue that that's exactly what we're seeing when we see small move in the way that it did, or we're seeing Chinese stocks jump 25 to 30 percent in a single day. This is just telling you that the markets are actually far more illiquid than the headline numbers would suggest, and we should kind of expect this sort of extreme move every time the narrative changes. So that, that that's the key point that I would emphasize there. Perfect. Well, maybe I'll let you just kind of continue on that thought. I know that um, we want to talk a little bit just about rising concentration risk and the elasticity sure. of stocks, but I think you've addressed some of that. So let me know um, if there's anything else on this slide you wanted to speak to. Otherwise, you well, can... I, I so I actually just came, um, Brian. When you made the joke, there's a new face on here. I thought you were referring to me because I'm fully made up for TV, but the. Um, you know, I was I was just in an event where Goldman Sachs was actually talking through their subdued forecast for equities over the next decade. So they've come out with an expectation of about 2% nominal return for the S&P 500 over the next decade. One of the components that they're pointing to is exactly this concentration risk. Effectively, the S&P is increasingly dominated by a few very richly valued names. Um, I will tell you that like my candid interpretation is that, yes, I certainly agree with those concerns, but as long as the underlying trends that I've talked about ad nauseum where money continues to flow into the S&P 500 or into cap-weighted indices, it's very hard for me to see this reversing itself until that changes. And so like I'm, I'm much more sanguine on the underlying status quo at the same time suggesting that there are very key risks out there these two charts of rising concentration, and in particular, that much lower elasticity, meaning that the ability to absorb volume changes for the largest cap stocks is really the defining feature of the market for me. And maybe one thing I would add to that, you mentioned, I think capital market assumptions from Goldman um, spent a lot of time at Invesco on our capital market assumption team. That's really an average, right? And it's a longer term horizon. So I think what we've seen over the last couple of years with kind of the market volatility being suppressed or in, ignited by Fed policy is that if we have a 15 to 20 percent sell off tomorrow, all of a sudden that capital market assumption at 3 percent goes up to 9 percent for equities. So I think that as investors think about long term investments, again, an average is an average at that. It's not a, a every year so I would say, too, our outlook for, for overall markets, I think, is still fairly robust or resilient, just given the backdrop. And I would expect what we've seen the last few years is that as we have these shakeouts, it's more of these kind of short-term dislocations, and then market support comes in to, to kind of smooth everything over. Yeah, I, 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 I think we share a lot of similarity on our views there. It just becomes a question for me of what is the order in which it occurs. 100% agree. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we've absolutely seen, and once again, this is a slide that people are relatively familiar with. The, this is looking at the flow of funds into the Vanguard total market strategy versus the S&P 500. One of the things, you know, the Vanguard total market index tends to be a product the, the Vanguard strategies associated with the total markets tends to be a strategy or product that re represents retirement flows. We've seen those interestingly slow materially. We, they've actually largely been flat since March 2023. This is, I think, one of the reasons why we've seen a little bit of um, 
we've seen a little bit of uh, lagged behavior from small caps and others that have really struggled. Where we've seen that offset has actually been a significant pickup of flows into areas like the S&P 500 strategies, large cap strategies, technology strategies, et cetera. I, I highlight this because I'm seeing more and more evidence that effectively people are starting to try to game the system. We actually just saw a survey released in which uh, investor expectations from investors in retirement programs surveyed by Vanguard showed rising expectations of returns at the exact time, same time that most strategists, ourselves included, are somewhat cautious about the impact of valuation on forward returns. This just speaks to you know the fact that all market cycles end, and at the end, people ultimately start chasing really what has worked, reinforcing those trends, making it feel it can't change. And then, of course, it changes. So this this is something that I'm paying very close attention to. Yeah, maybe in the interest of time, just want to make sure we have enough uh, time allocated at the end to talk about our strategies. Um, anything in particular, Mike, that you wanted to highlight in regards to views on fixed income and going forward some opportunities? Well, I mean, this is a very straightforward chart, and it's one you and I talked through about the dynamics of steepening in the curve. So part of what you're seeing with the performance of the 10-year is simply a byproduct of the curve having been as deeply inverted as it was. That means that as rates rally at the front end, the 10-year and the 30-year are going to struggle to participate. Now, that's important for the economy. It's one of the reasons why I'm somewhat skeptical of home builders and others in that space because we've already seen the impact of that backup in rates, the failure to respond to a much lower or to a significant cut in the Fed funds. You know, the Fed is going to have to keep pressure on that front end in order to get the back end to, quote unquote, behave. And all the time, people are going to be worried about a resurgence of inflation. Once again, I'm not that worried about it, but that is absolutely a market fear. This suggests that many of the interest rate sensitive components of the economy, things like autos, things like homes, could continue to struggle. Perfect. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead here. Um, let's talk about some of the risks that are ahead of us and then we'll jump right into um, the underlying strategies here at Simplify. So I think I spoke to this, um, but just to highlight again, uh, some of the potential risks within the equity market if mar uh, the mega caps do sell off um, or from the other side of the spectrum, thinking about the opportunity if there's a rise in kind of the other end of the spectrum, some catalysts for this, of course, the restructuring of large versus small cap outperformance, antitrust regulation, I think, as we look forth to the upcoming election, depending on who takes the helm, uh, that could become a more prevalent risk in the year ahead. Um, AI's impact, if we think about the trickle down effect, right, we were so focused on mega caps and the AI trade and theme. Um, but as smaller cap companies can adopt some of this, so that could be another tailwind for the smaller cap segment of the market. And then already mentioned, of course, earnings growth. Um, I think one last thing we should probably talk about from a risk perspective is just thinking about kind of the Fed's dual mandate. Uh, we have seen inflation uh, moderate, moving closer to the Fed's target, not quite there, um, but moving in the right direction. And then, of course, the um, unemployment rate um, main, is maintaining a fairly low level relative to history. So from a historical perspective, still quite um, contained and there hasn't been that kind of tear or run up in the unemployment rate that a lot of people were expecting in the last month or two here. Um, so maybe before we jump in, um, Mike, any last points that you wanted to highlight around this topic? Yeah, I, I, this is something that people have heard me emphasize, and I think it is actually really, really important for people to appreciate that, that the character of the labor market has been shifted significantly since the last real recession, the global financial crisis, by the presence of an app-based gig economy. Um, what we are seeing is household perceptions of the financial situation tied to future income prospects are weakening sharply. Historically, that has been consistent with a rapidly rising unemployment rate. We are seeing less of that, as Paisley pointed out. But I do want to highlight that really a big chunk of this is how we define unemployment. And so part of what we're really seeing is a surge in workers who are working part-time and temporary gigs, a decline in full-time employment. And we can actually see this in a somewhat natural test, right? So if we look at things like driving for Uber or DoorDash, 
in most states, you actually cannot drive for them if you are under the age of 25 for insurance purposes. As a result, if we look at the spread between the 16 to 24 employment and those above the age of 25, we actually are seeing a very, very different story. The 16 to 24 looks exactly like you would expect. The unemployment rate there has climbed from about 6.5% to nearly 10%. If you look at the unemployment rate for those over 25, it's significantly less, but we've seen full-time job loss that seems to have been replaced by what the Bureau of Labor Statistics defines as a job, but most Americans would think of as temporary employment in between real employment. This is going to be a real test for the Fed and candidly for policymakers as we look forward, because we've just never had this type of vehicle before, how we interpret this. How we want to react to it is something I think we just haven't decided on a societal basis yet. Perfect. Um, just looking at the clock here, I am going to have us move ahead um, and get right into why we're probably all joined today is to talk really about Simplify strategies and their performance during the third quarter. Um, we don't have favorite children, but we have highlighted a couple of strategies that are either really topical from being either a flagship strategy from an AUM perspective at Simplify, topical given some of the kind of market backdrop that we just highlighted, and then also some strategies that have had some really stellar performance. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, we're going to kind of go through the, the strategies we just highlighted on this last si slide, um, but let's speak to mortgages first. Uh, first off, I think it's important to recognize that mortgages are the second largest allocation within a core bond kind of passive market index. Um, many of us may or may not have a dedicated mortgage allocation, uh, but after the uh, information I present today, I think a case can easily be made why a, a different approach to mortgages within the portfolio may be beneficial. Um, I think what's also really important is that MTBA, which is our mortgage ETF, just launched last November. Again, Harley Bassman is our mortgage guy. Uh, he brought this strategy to market. We've already raised a billion and a half in AUM. Um, and it's actually a fairly simple concept. So we're looking at, um, uh, or focusing on buying new issue uh, TBAs, which stands for to be announced agency mortgages. And because they are agency mortgages, they're carrying little to no credit risk. Um, and TBAs can be viewed um, kind of similar to buying futures contracts, and that TBAs represent a contract to buy MBS on a specific date in the future. And given this futures contract structure, we can imply that there's a lot of liquidity in these underlying vehicles as well. So the key benefit I would share, though, is that by buying new issue, think about if you're out, if you're a home buyer, uh, if you were buying uh, a home five years ago, locking in uber low rates, um, you know, sub 3%. Today's um, new issue mortgages are much higher coupons. So that's the key advantage, I would say, over just going out and buying the passive market index is higher coupons and as a result, also lower duration. Um, and on that note, I can talk about last quarter's performance for MTBA. You'll see here the trailing three month. This is as of 930 underperformed versus the MBS index. And this is driven by that lower duration profile. So we overall saw yields come lower last quarter, and that was the ultimate kind of uh, headwind for this strategy. The other thing I might mention on MTBA, um, beyond the success that we've seen since launch, is just looking at the opportunity set of mortgages relative to investment grade credit within a portfolio. Oftentimes, uh, allocators may think of those as two different levers to pull. Um, you can see here historically, or relative to historical, uh, MBS new issue mortgages have quite an attractive spread relative to their other counterparts in a bond portfolio being the MBS uh, index that we discussed as well as investment grade credit. Um, so you think about the timing of the launch of this fund last November um, and then really looking at kind of locking in and um, taking advantage of some of that spread differential. So again, little to no credit risk given the agency focus and attractive uh, yield or coupon pickup over kind of the index approach to mortgages. Just very quickly before we move off that page, I just wanted to highlight the, the two key things that I think are important in this product. One is part of the reason why that spread is higher than it has been historically is precisely because interest rates are higher. The fear is that these mortgages will be refinanced quickly you'll lose that coupon and be refinanced into a lower coupon piece of paper. So there's an increased risk spread associated with that. 
The reason I think that's super interesting is one, we've seen a combination of factors actually meaningfully play out. We're actually starting to see rising defaults and delinquencies in the homeowner space. It's particularly isolated in mortgages uh, that were issued at higher rates. We're actually seeing those components play through. That suggests actually that it's going to be harder for people to refinance, all else being equal, and could extend the duration of these products. I there's no guarantee that that's going to happen, but that's certainly one of the benefits that I think we're looking at. And the second component is, of course, the steepening of the curve that Paisley highlighted. Even as the Fed is cutting, we're not seeing a response at the back end that many realtors had assured everyone that it was going to happen. Rates have not come lower in mortgages. I think we actually just crossed 7% today for the first time in a very long time. Um, so these actually are getting longer duration, I think, than we had modeled and expected, and it continues to represent an opportunity in the space. Perfect. I appreciate that additional insight. So let's move on to core bonds. AGGH is Simplified's active approach to the core bond or aggregate bond market here in the U.S., uh, really focused on targeting the highest risk-adjusted yields across sectors, uh, finding dislocations across the yield curve and thinking about where there's opportunity um, relative to certain duration. And then lastly, this strategy is looking at uh, selling options to enhance the overall yield profile. You'll see here on the top left, since inception, AGGH has outperformed on an annualized basis, uh, the U.S. kind of core bond market or the ag. Um, and specifically to last quarter's performance, you'll see that the strategy did outperform by about 100 basis points over the U.S. Ag Index, and this was really driven by that component of selling options to enhance the overall income. Uh, the portfolio manager on the strategy, Shailash Gupta, um, is really taking an active approach and thinking about opportunities across those various levers. I think the one thing that's also really important, oftentimes when you say active bonds, you're probably going to think that there's large duration bets significantly going down in credit quality to pick up the extra income. And I want to be clear, the overall target for AGGH is to maintain a similar duration and a similar credit quality profile as uh, the ag index. Maybe talking about some of the uh, current positioning as well, just to bring to life some of the active uh, components that I mentioned that Shailash will look to implement in this portfolio. We talked about looking across the curve and finding dislocations. We've highlighted here kind of the 20 year tenor across the curve that provides an attractive opportunity to overweight uh, via futures. And then also what some may be wondering is why the, the end of the curve kind of has that kink down. Uh, there's a strong demand or strong bid from pensions just to match their longer duration liabilities, which is kind of keeping um, keeping that anchored. So opportunity here to overweight in the 20 year part of the curve. And then lastly, I can mention for Ag H is that we are overweight mortgages for all the reasons we've just mentioned um, and then underweight investment grade credit, uh, given the tighter spreads uh, that we're seeing in that uh, sector. This differential between swap spreads and, and treasury rates has actually got two separate components to it that play through in some other areas as well. One of the things that we focus on or that we highlight for people is the relative tightness of credit spreads. Part of that can actually be explained by some, of, some evidence that balance sheets are a little tighter and have a little more struggle affording stuff than they have had in the past. That's why the spread between a financed vehicle like a treasury and a um, uh, you know, a, a product like swaps that ultimately doesn't require the same balance sheet capacity to it, the swaps are actually trading cheaper, i.e. lower yield than the treasuries are in many instances. That makes some things like credit look a little less expensive than they might otherwise. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. So maybe we'll jump to SVOL. Um, when we think about one of Simplify's flagship strategies, I would absolutely uh, categorize SVOL in that category. Um, SVOL is our volatility premium ETF. Uh, we now have over a billion, I think 1.2 billion or greater in AUM in that strategy. This is also managed by Shailash Gupta. And we really view this as an attractive diversifier uh, within a portfolio alongside equity, and especially for anyone with an income objective. So as of the end of the quarter, the distribution rate on SVOL was 15.25. Uh, down just slightly from the historical uh, distribution rate that's really commensurate with the drop in yields given the Fed rate cut. So just wanted to highlight that. Still really attractive long-term 
um, income potential for that strategy. Um, and as a reminder, SVOL uh, sells volatility via VIX futures, um, and it does so to produce that premium or that options income. Additional sources of income in SVOL include treasuries, uh, as well as fixed income ETFs, so some diversified sources of income beyond just the option selling. And I just, uh, yeah, I want to hit on SFAL for a second here because yeah. unfortunately, SFAL is our product that is most directly affected by things like the VIX spike in August. We actually saw a drawdown associated with that. I know a number of people have asked questions around that, and I think that's actually a really important one to highlight. Part of the idea behind SFAL is very straightforward. One, we take products like the VIX futures and the shorts associated with those. We actually delever them to make the product less volatile than competing products that were in the space beforehand that might have not uh, worked out so well. Um, that reduced volatility really paid dividends. I encourage people to look at the performance differential that emerged between SFAL and other strategies that target inverse performance or short volatility performance over this time period. It really highlights the importance of reducing that leverage. The second component is, is that this is actually a quarter in which the hedges help to pay off. And so this product on a like for like basis, I actually would really highlight as, as having survived that process exceptionally well. And I think maybe to that point, Mike, is thinking about what transpired during the quarter and for the strategies that were short volatility to come out of the quarter with almost a 2% positive return. I think is really attractive, right? So yes, we did underperform the S&P 500, which had a really strong quarter as our official benchmark, of course. Uh, but I do think to your point on the hedges that the strategy employs and kind of the delevered version of shorting the volatility, all of those risk mitigation and controlled uh, kind of active components to the strategy really speak to, to Shailesh's approach. So, Mike, maybe I'll let you um, cover CDX as well, just given uh, your closeness to the strategy. Sure. So CDX is one of the products I manage. Uh, this is our high yield with credit enhancement fund. The uh, way this product is designed is, is very similar to AgH. It's in terms of its overall conception, with the objective here being to reduce the unique risk profile for credit, which is that credit spread exposure. The way we do that is by running a long short equity overlay in which we are long quality companies, companies with strong and stable profit margins, high quality balance sheets, uh, and high cash flow generation that's used to return capital to shareholders. We select those from a pool of a thousand, the 1,000 largest US uh, liquid stocks. We are then short a basket that has very dissimilar characteristics. We are shorting companies that have unstable profitability, low margins, and that are constantly tapping capital markets. What that means is we're effectively long refinancing risk. And that is the key risk that exists within high yield and credit. High yield, the companies cannot pay off their debt. They constantly need to refinance it. And so what you're really worried about in the high yield is a systemic widening of credit spreads associated with that refinancing risk. The quality junk overlay worked out really, really well this quarter in an environment in which we were able to actually see credit spreads widen a couple of times. Things like the events in July and August actually provided components of this. That um, overlay worked out brilliantly, provided significant additional excess return and then the second thing that actually has been working for us, although a little bit less well um, in the past couple of quarters, as we've seen high yield in general attract more interest, has been the returns associated with how we access high yield. We do that through what's called a total return swap in which we're taking advantage of the fact that so many people short the publicly traded high yield ETFs within credit funds in order to reduce their market exposure. We use that to our benefit using that total return swap to obtain a portion of the securities lending fees associated with that. Between those two, we believe that the high yield product is capable of matching the performance of the benchmark, even during periods in which credit spreads remain stable over a credit cycle. We think there's the potential for significant outperformance. And importantly, that should come during periods of credit spread widening when it's most beneficial to a portfolio. Perfect. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll make some comments now on CTA. So um, 
in just the short period of time that I've been at Simplify, I've spent a lot of time on this strategy. And I think for good reason, we're seeing a lot of interest um, and something I wanted to mention earlier, but just wanted to keep us moving for time purposes is really thinking about the full valuations and equities, um, tight credit spreads, thinking about really the correlation or kind of behavior between stocks and bonds and how that has kind of changed over the last couple of years with higher rates. Um, correlations have increased between asset classes, uh, at least in the immediate past. So as we think about building resilient, diversified portfolios going forward, um, as we look at stocks and bonds, there's those traditional asset classes, uh, they're not really looking as attractive as they have historically. Um, so how can we think about protecting our portfolios? How can we think about diversifying our risks and return? Uh, so enter CTA. So CTA is our managed future strategy, a systematic approach to thinking about going either long or short various commodities and interest rate futures within North America. Uh, you'll see here performance has been very stellar uh, since its inception in kind of early 2022. Um, I'll talk about the quarter performance here in a moment, uh, but has delivered, um, and I think through today's date, uh, the annualized excess return is well north of 6% now. Um, and the reason I highlight that is because the objective of the strategy to, to deliver attractive absolute returns has absolutely delivered that. And it's done so while also producing negative correlation uh, to both stocks and bonds. So you'll see here since inception, CTA has had a negative 0.2 correlation to the S&P 500 and an even greater diversification benefit against U.S. bonds, negative correlation of uh, 0.45. Uh, so as you think about diversifiers in the portfolio, liquid capital efficient ways to diversify your portfolio risk going forward, but without sacrificing absolute return, uh, we really view CTA as an attractive opportunity going forward. And then just specific to last quarter's performance, uh, although we did outperform the underlying benchmark, uh, just given the, um, the rally we saw in both stocks and bonds last quarter, uh, CTA did slightly underperform traditional assets, uh, just given the lack of duration and given the lack of equity beta, uh, which played out well last quarter. Um, so really excited about that strategy in particular. Uh, just given the broader backdrop. And the last strategy that we wanted to specifically highlight today, of course, we can talk about others, is our healthcare ETF, pink. Um, and it's not, not uh, by accident that I'm wearing a pink blazer today as well. Uh, pink is really special. It's the first pro bono ETF that provides all of the net proceeds to a nonprofit organization. So Pink donates, and you'll see here on this slide, Mike Taylor, who's the portfolio manager for this strategy. This was just a week or so ago at the New York Stock Exchange, giving a check donation to Susan G. Komen. Since inception, I think we've delivered over 250,000 um, in a donation to the organization. Um, so if you think about impact investing, um, I think this is really special and a unique way to think about impact investing. Uh, but specifically to performance, uh, we've also had really stellar performance relative to the benchmark, which I think is all, also wonderful to highlight. Uh, since inception, you'll see here a really strong uh, outperformance versus the MSCI healthcare index. Um, and annualized, we've delivered about 4.5% uh, return in the three years since inception over that benchmark. Um, when we think about healthcare as a sector, and I'm sure it doesn't get as much love as the tech sector, uh, but there's a lot of dispersion within healthcare, which allows for really strong PMs like Mike Taylor to find those stocks, uh, avoid the areas where uh, there could be idiosyncratic risk, and really lean into stock selection from a fundamental perspective. Uh, so Mike's done an amazing job uh, for Pink, and like I said, we just hit our three-year track record um, and really excited about uh, some of these tailwinds uh, in the sector. And I, I would just compliment Mike Taylor as well. He's one of my best friends. He has done extraordinarily well in terms of managing this. And for those of you who had followed his personal story, part of Mike's commitment to the healthcare sector is a function of some personal healthcare challenges that he's been dealing with that actually required his retirement from the hedge fund space. We have been very fortunate to pick him up as he's been on the rebound in terms of his health, and he has been tickled pink by his opportunity to give back through the pink fund. So congratulations, Mike. I'm so proud of you. I see what you did there. Tickled pink. Yes. Yes. Um, 
So with that, um, and here's Mike's profile. Mike and I, I wish he was on the call. We'd both be rocking our pink blazers together in honor of uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month and the pink ETF. Um, but super exciting story. So definitely check that out. Um, so that's all I have prepared in regards to specific strategies. Mike, uh, we obviously have a couple more minutes here. Is there anything that we glossed over that we'd like to revisit? Anything in particular that you'd like to highlight uh, for any of the strategies that weren't in focus for this month's uh, review? I, I, I'm not going to do that, but it, we did have a question about what is the strategy of CTA. And I do, while we're on this slide, just want to highlight very quickly that CTA is the Simplify Managed Futures product um, strategy that is managed by Altus Investments, which is run by Charlie McGuera, um, who was uh, who used to run the metals trading desk at Goldman Sachs. Um, that product is somewhat unique in its area. The managed future space Paisley was highlighting is a unique diversifier to both equities and bonds. It's trend following strategy. And so it automatically will gravitate to being long what is working and short what is not working. That's standard for the space. It's one of the reasons why many have used CTAs as forms of protection in their portfolio in the past. CTA is actually taking it a step further. It's designed to be work, to be used in concert with equity-centric portfolios. And so one of the assets that we actually exclude from the mix that can be used there, and that's an expanding mix as the asset grow, as the product grows in size, we're able to increase the trading capability and increase the types of assets that we can trade there. But we are keeping equities out specifically because we do not want people to be double loading their equity exposure in an already equity centric portfolio. We want this to provide that diversification benefit. And it's, as you pointed out, just done phenomenally well in, in achieving its objectives. So maybe just given some of the um, activity, I think there was a question that came in around um, high as well as FIG. Um, anything there that you would like to, to highlight? Sure. So high is actually a product that is designed to take advantage of short-term equity volatility. It encounters the same challenges in many ways as Asphalt did this quarter. This was a particularly challenging quarter for it. But um, we actually have been working through some changes in the algorithm there. We're incorporating some of the tools that we've developed at Tier 1 Alpha, one of the, pro one of the companies that I'm involved with alongside Simplify, that will actually incorporate some signals that we hope to see continued improvement and return there. Um, on FIG, as you know, we're going through a process of portfolio redesign and change. Candidly, I got the call wrong on equities versus bonds in this past year, and it's time for us to rethink components of that exposure. And so, Paisley, you're actually going to be coming on board with me to help manage portions of that portfolio. I'm looking forward to the additional insights, and we'll see what FIG looks like as we go into the fourth quarter with a new uh, uh, product redesign around that. That sounds great. I'm also excited. Thanks, Mike. Um, so... Doesn't look like there's any other questions in the chat. Um, maybe the last question, Mike, I would have for you. I know that, and by the way, if everybody doesn't know this, Mike is a very popular guy. He was on Bloomberg today. He was on Yahoo today. Apparently was also at a Goldman event. Um, so he has a lot of insights to share. Is What keeps you up at night, Mike? I know that's like a kind of a stereotypical question, but uh, just heading into election, heading into fourth quarter, which historically has been a strong performance for stock markets. Um, are we cautious? Are we optimistic? How are we feeling? Um, like every American, I'm nervous about the implications of the election. I will tell you candidly, as I get older and something you get to look forward to is you just don't sleep all that well anyway. So what keeps me up at night is far less important than what gets me to sleep at night. Um, I, I would say the, the, the two key risks that I'm monitoring closely or, or um, paying a lot of attention to is the impact of a tight election and how that process trans, uh, transitions itself here in the United States. And then the second thing that I continue to just be worried about, and candidly, as November approaches, I grow less worried about it, but is, is the rising political tensions between the United States and China. I think we've actually seen some indications that that may have um, de-risked itself in the last few days. There seems to have been a little bit of progress. China has blinked on a few things. In particular, 
they are pushing less. Uh, they're pushing their automotive uh, manufacturers to to make fewer inroads in Europe. That doesn't seem like a big deal, but that's actually how the Japanese transition began in terms of reducing their export bias and facilitated effectively the 1990s and a peace dividend that emerged as Japan decided they weren't going to challenge the United States. That would be a very hopeful outcome. I'm skeptical that we'll see that, but that would be something that I I'm monitoring really closely. Not at all hurt by the fact that I have a son in the Navy. So I'm, I'm paying attention to that risk a lot. Perfect. Um, well, again, super excited to be here at Simplify. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really looking forward to meeting hopefully a lot of you in the in the months to come and working with you guys more closely. Um, so maybe I'll hand it back to Brian to close us out. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, Mike, Paisley, this was awesome. Paisley, you crushed it on your first go. So uh, we're excited to have you as, uh, as a regular part of this. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your uh, your trust in Simplify. If we didn't get anything, please reach out to us. Um, and if you want to uh, revisit anything that, uh, that Mike and Paisley covered, we'll have this posted on our website and YouTube channel as soon as possible. Uh, but again, reach out to us at info at simplify.us. The next live event we have coming up is our uh, monthly Keeping It Simple webcast slash podcast. Mike and Harley are going to welcome Barry Knapp from Ironsides Macroeconomics. But thank you, everyone, again, for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.